So um, what I want to talk about here is what I'm calling finally MTL. Uh, I want to introduce this idea called a finally tagless encoding of DSLs. I'm going to talk about that pretty briefly, and then I'm going to talk about how MTL, which is a called the Monad Transformer Library in Haskell, is actually an, an example of a really widespread example of using finally tagless DSLs. And I think it's not often recognized that those are actually pretty much the same technique, and that finally tagless DSLs are actually fairly popular and used in a lot of different places. And so um, I'll dive right in. So this one's a little bit faster, hopefully. Tale of three DSLs. This one's one that a lot of people might be familiar with. It's called Hutton's Razor sometimes. It's the simplest DSL that anyone can imagine, I guess. It's um, the adding language. The adding language represents integers and represents the addition of integers. And so we have two constructors. We can inject integers into the adding language, and then we can take two um, elements of the adding language and say that we want to add them together. We can build an interpreter for the add language. This just takes any value of the add language and turns it into the integer that we believe it should represent, interpreting it as, a, as an integer. And to do this, we just have to pull the integer out of the, uh, the literal constructor if we have one of those. And if we have an adding constructor, then we have to interpret both sides of it to get the integers that those represent and then add them together. Pretty simple. Here's an expression of the add language. Hopefully, this is nothing too complicated, uh, especially since you just sat through the last one. <laughs> um, Another language you might use is Putton's backup razor, which is the exact same language, but instead of adding now, we're going to multiply. So literally, these two languages are extraordinarily similar. <laughs> um, but you might want both of them. And in fact, you might be programming something that doesn't necessarily have the add and the multiply language, but maybe other two, two other um, DSLs which you want to work in. Now we have Hutton's travel kit, which he goes traveling with. Um, which is the add language and the multiplication language glued together somehow. In particular, we can do this very simply by building a DSL which simply has a constructor for both the adding operation and the multiplying operation. Our interpreter just has to handle the adding operation and the multiplying operation. And then our expressions can be constructed using either addition or multiplication, which is, you know, pretty nice. Unfortunately, Anyone looking at this probably is cringing because I just spent all this time defining this language and all the time def defining this language. And then gluing them together, I repeated basically everything all over again. And so we have a standard problem of we can't necessarily just compose these languages together, and so we end up repeating ourselves a lot. Um, so we can do things like the technique of pattern functions, which was talked about um, at 10 o'clock today, to try to fix this problem. So I'm just going to run really quickly through the operation of uh, splitting those languages into pieces and then being able to reassemble them nicely. And so this is the same language we had before, the ring language language. Um, what we're going to do, oh, I'm just sorry. There we go. <laughs> what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to take add language and multiplication language and stick them together somehow to form ring language. I got messed up on my slides. So let's try it again. So we introduced the fixed point of types, which we saw uh, an hour ago. Hopefully, everyone's familiar with this one. Um, given any fixed point of types, we can use this fix fold operation in order to turn an algebra on that functor and extend that algebra into the fixed point, very similar to what we were doing in the last talk. Um, these are a little bit annoying, because if we want to show these things, we're going to need undecidable instances, but whatever. Um, and then we create two pattern functors, one for the addition language, one for the multiplication language. These are pretty much identical to the type constructors that existed when we wrote the ASTs out concretely, but they have an, an X, a, a type parameter, instead of actually recursively de declaring, the uh, declaring them recursively. And then if we hit those with fix, we get the add line and the multiplication language just back the way we had them before. Um, we can write the expressions. These are the same expressions that I exemplified before. They're a little bit annoying because I have to throw that fix constructor in there again, but no big deal. Then we can add some smart constructors if we really want. We can completely ignore the fact that we had to do this fix thing. So all right, great. Let's throw some smart constructors and run off the end of my slide. Um, we can have the interpreter for the add language. We can have the, multi the interpreter for the multiplication language. These are pretty much the exact same. The pretty much the exact same code which was in the interpreters of the original languages, just now they're operating on functors instead of the data types directly. And we can create the interpreters of those two languages. So all I'm demonstrating here is that by doing this fixed point recursion schemes surgery, we can take the exact same DSLs that we were working with before, but express them as a functor smashed into a fixed point of uh, functors. Then, if we introduce this guy, 
the, uh, the functor sum, which allows us to turn any two functors into another functor, which is either the first functor or the second functor, depending on which one we care about. Um, we can create the eliminator, the fold sum, which does the exact same we're, thing we're doing back here. Um, this is just fix fold, but instead of operating on a single uh, functor, it operates on, uh, sorry, this is just taking uh, an algebra for each functor and sticking them together into the combined algebra. So it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. And then we can build the ring language as the fixed point of the sum of the add, fun add functor and the multiplication functor. So by doing the surgery, we're able to pull out the common pieces, stick them all into the fixed point machinery, and then have the specific pieces to the add addition steps and the specific pieces to the multiplication steps and stick them together nicely. And we end up with our ring language. We have to build a bunch of more smart constructors and ultimately it works. So cool, we used Haskell. We used all sorts of really cool type machinery and we managed to pull off a composable DSL. We had to write about 40 new lines, use three more pragmas, but we got to use fix and anger, so win. <laughs> Truly though, that's a really cool thing. I don't wanna say anything bad about this process. It was talked about again at 10 o'clock, if you guys saw that one. It's um, from data types a la carte. It's a really interesting technique for kind of solving the expression problem. And I don't want to denigrate it at all. At all. I just want to talk about a different way of solving this problem. So if that was uh, data types a la carte, now I want to talk about data types a la carette. Kislav and Shan. Um, <laughs> so let's try this again. Exact same game as before. But instead of representing all of our types concretely, as these very obvious ASTs, I'm going to just uh, talk about what it means to add things together and what it means to multiply things together. And so hopefully you can see that add here has a lot of similarities to, um, if I scroll back a bunch of slides, unfortunately, to add lang. That add constructor right there takes an add lang and an add lang and gives you an add lang back. And all the way down here, this add method of the adds type class does a similar thing for any kind of type V. Um, we, can do a similar, we can do another one for multiplies. We can instantiate these with really obvious types like integer. And then we can create little expressions, which are integer languages. We can add one and three together, and we can multiply one and three together. And hopefully this looks completely trivial and boring and dumb. But um, oh, we also, sorry, I cheated. Over here, when we um, put one and three in, those are forced to be integers because we only can do that. But if we add this new class from integer, which also gives us the ability to inject integers in, in the same way that the literal constructors of our um, ASTs before allowed us to inject in, uh, integers into the ASTs, then um, we can write something like this. This is effectively the same thing that we're writing here before, just now that we've noted that even the integers have to be expressed, uh, injected into our language explicitly, we can get a very different kind of type, which is really what the focus here is. The type is for any V, which instantiates both addition and the ability to inject integers into it. This little expression of language is one of those Vs. We can do the same thing with the multiplication expression. For any V which has both multiplication and the ability to inject integers, this expression is of that type. And so if we specialize v to, um, to integer, like we were showing before, we can get back these exact same expressions. But we have something more general here. We are asking only for, we're asking of any type which instantiates at least these two interfaces, at least these two uh, classes, then our expression here is exactly what we're, is what's being expressed. So um, we can even now, Unlike before, where we had to do all of this fixed point surgery and creating the uh, sum of functors, we can actually just add these two languages together by just listing out all of the constraints all at once. And so I can call a new uh, set of constraints called rings of v, which just demands that we both can convert things from integers. We can add them and we can multiply them. And now this rings expression is exactly the same as the ring expression from when I was using the concrete DSL, but it's being expressed without any extra fixed point machinery, without any surgery, anything like that, just very directly by stating we just need addition, multiplication, and the ability to get integers into it. I have a question. Mm -hmm. 
is integer the most specific type you need, or could you use naturals or even booleans? Uh, you could inject. In the same way when you're building a DSL, you can inject whatever type you want. You might have to build a constructor for booleans and a constructor for naturals and a constructor for integers. In this case, I've only asked for the capability to inject integers because that's all I need. But I could create a new class called in from naturals and have the, the I type here be maybe called N and say natural into our type. And then if I, instead of having this constructor saying from integer add and multiply, it was from integer, from natural, add and multiply. And then I would be able to inject naturals in the same way that I'm injecting integers. So it's just a design choice, really. So this rings expression, if we put it into an interpreter, immediately pops out 15. But that just has to do with the defaulting rules. It's defaulting to guess that, this, that we wanted an integer for v. But if we instantiate something else, like ring lang, and we note that there's an exact correspondence between the, the literal uh, constructor from ring lang, the addition constructor from ring lang, and the multiplication constructor from ring lang, then we can ask for v to be specialized to ring lang instead of integer, and it will give us our DSL exactly like we hope. And so what I really want to indicate here is that there's an exact correspondence between this type here, the from integer adds and multiplies all of those constraints together, and that DSL that we were working with before. The same constructors are there, and if we want to um, take an expression of this type, rings of v, any v that instantiates rings, then we can uh, see that as being, or we can, we can instantiate v as our concrete, DSL, uh, our concrete DSL AST and get that back immediately. And so this technique that I've been talking about is a really, really simplified form of the technique of finely tagless DSLs, which were in, uh, introduced and popularized by Karet and Kislyov and um, Shan. Um, and the advantages that we have is that we are composing just by adding constraints together. We're creating a big list of constraints back here. And if we want to add new constraints, such as the, the, introdu the introduction of naturals like you were talking about, all we have to do is just add another constraint to the list. So the constraints just um, stack up like that. We don't have to explicitly talk about them being on the left side or the right side. We don't have to create new machinery for um, fixed points. We don't have to create new machinery for pattern functors. We can get all of that just by expressing exactly what we want. We want some type which has the ability to add, the ability to multiply, and the ability to accept integers. And so we don't have to mention the concrete left and rights. That is where the tag list comes from. Um, but if we do actually have one of those ASTs, we can show that that AST instantiates exactly what we're talking about. We can directly interpret our demands for injection of integers, addition, and multiplication as the constructors of that AST and get it back directly. And so there's a correspondence between these two things. And I kind of want to suggest that anything that you would do with a DSL in the very concrete AST format, you can do with this finally tagless style as well by just gluing together different demands that you have of the language. They're, I don't want to say isomorphic, but they're um, related to one another and such that you can get the same job done. And so the question is, does it work at scale? Does this keep building? Can you keep gluing constraints together until the end? And um, my quick answer is yes, because we have the Mono Transformer library. And I really want to uh, talk about here is that the Mono Transfer li Transformer library, which is sometimes um, people complain about it because it uses a lot of prolog and or type classes, um, is an exact uh, instantiation of a finally tagless pattern. We have a similar kind of uh, type up here where for any monad, we don't necessarily know what that one is. As long as it instantiates this monad state interface, then we can construct a operation that fits that interface because we're using git and set, which just demand that whatever monad we're in is a state monad. Um, if we want to go and pull a concrete uh, manifestation of that interface, we can go to the transformers library and pull out the actual state monad, which is an actual data type, and just go ahead and claim that the M that we are talking about here is state, and it will run concretely. It will run immediately. We can also, I guess, be more explicit here and talk about the transformer stack that exists, the state T and identity glued together. And so 
what MTL is giving you is the ability to just specify exactly what constraints you want, what are the capabilities, what are the effects that we need in order to write this computation. And then when the person is writing a monadic value, they don't have to determine exactly how these uh, transformers are going to stack together, what is exactly the concrete representation of this effect type. You just say what you need. And then when you compile it, the compiler will actually solve for you what the, the answer that you are demanding is. And so if we have an operation which requires state and air and I.O., we could solve that as a, a free transformer over um, some kind of state and air functor if we wanted. We can, transform, we can interpret it as the, the state transformer stacked on top of the either transformer stacked on top of I.O. We can interpret it in the other order. All of those things are ways of instantiating the demands that um, the person who wrote op needed. And so a lot of people don't necessarily like this. A lot of people have a little bit of com complaints about the MTL. I find it really interesting. I find it really useful and practical. But um, I have to go ahead and address the fact that it doesn't do everything you want. Um, one thing that people often talk about is the fact that if you look at the transformers library and you look at the instances for, say, state t, there are effectively three. This monad trans one gives you all that you need because it allows you to create your stacks really explicitly. But when we go and do the same thing in the um, monad transformer library, uh, it runs off the page. And this is because we have to actually tell the, the, the prolog that's running your type classes, what are all the acceptable ways to combine effects? What are all the acceptable ways to pass effects through one another? And um, that's not a straightforward answer. The way that effects combine is not so simple. And so we actually have to declare all of the ways that they're going to combine. Um, so people talk about how the fact that if you have n classes and m concrete instantiations, then you end up with the square of implementation work. And this is more or less true. Um, but I want to talk about how the fact that the primary place where this is born, like if you're just using MTL, you don't have to worry about that too much. The people who maintain MTL have to worry about actually instantiating all those m times, n times m instances. Yes? I mean, isn't, isn't that sort of just a fact of nature, though, that yeah. effects compose in different ways? It doesn't matter how you want to represent it. You're still going to have to, represent, you're going to, have to write that code somewhere. Absolutely, yeah. And I think um, what the, the nice thing about this is when you have the, the need to write n times n instances, the fact that some of those instances don't make any sense can be expressed by simply not having those instances. But if you don't have the space to even talk about there are n times n possible instances, then you have to just assume that they all exist. Um, but for users, if you're using this in your own applications, you don't have to worry about that too much, because your own personal finely tagless classes are going to be maybe one or two of them with one or two concrete in some implementations. And so n times m might be like four or six. Um, yeah, so this is just what I was talking about there, where we actually are allowed to talk about all of the predicates that actually exist about whether um, different compositions of effects are allowable or not. And so have, by having n times n possible instances you could write, you're allowed to talk about the ones that don't exist. Um, the other thing that I mentioned earlier really quickly, just to kind of finish this off, is that MTL forces you to forget about the ordering of your effects. And that can actually be a big problem because, for instance, if you commute some effects, you end up with actually totally different um, behaviors. And so if you're writing something in this MTL style, this finally tagless style, you're kind of dependent on whoever. Maybe it's not you. Somebody else is going to use your values and interpret them. You're dependent upon them not cheating and doing something wrong or misunderstanding what you wanted. And that's, I think, merely a drawback of this kind of style. When you're only using constraints and demands at the level of uh, the, of the type constraints, then you don't have the ability to express ordering. Um, so ultimately, this kind of comes down to convention and communication. You have to state laws. You have to talk about how those laws combine. So you could talk about monad parser being a particular way of combining state and air. And if someone instantiates monad parser there, it's dependent upon them to do it right. Or you could even create a more uh, concrete, finally tagless style effect where you're saying exactly what each one of these things mean. Again, the implementer of this type, the interpreter of this type, is required to know what it means and use it properly. Um, there's one more drawback here, but it's definitely running close to the end of time. So I just want to say, explicit, when you're using a lot of explicit structure, sometimes using the type class prolog in Haskell is really convenient. It allows you to talk about exactly what you want, the fact that you just need certain effects and need certain operations. Um, finally, tagless style can be used to represent pretty much any AST you want. 
And MTL is a pretty mature example of using finally tagged list in anger. And so if you want to explore this and think about it in that way, take a look at MTL. All right. Thanks, everyone.